Hey everybody, welcome to this week's podcast. So I decided to try something a little bit different on the audio. Um, I've been loving my Blue Yeti microphone, but after seeing the last few Electro Boom videos, I decided to just give a cheap lav mic a shot. So here we go. I got right at about titty level, a lav mic uh, right between my man boobs. And I don't know, hopefully this will make a difference. Um, I really liked the Blue Yeti mic because, uh, you know, it was loud and it picked up my voice pretty well, but unfortunately it also picked everything up. I think during one of the podcasts, like, um, you know, like my neighbor's doorbell rang or something and you could actually hear it in the podcast. So, you know, whatever, I'm just trying to, uh, always make a little bit better progress. You know, I'm still got this screen. Uh, the only reason, the only reason I don't have a full blue screen set up yet is just for the space. Like I just don't, I don't have room anywhere to just set up a full green screen thing, but hopefully that'll come eventually. Uh, and I could start making this look professional, but, uh, I don't know. Let me know uh, in the comments what you think of the lav mic. Before I jump into the news, I just want to address the Patreon controversy real quick. So if you haven't heard, they switched everything back to the way it was, which is good because that means they're actually listening to people and realized how badly they screwed up. So for the short term, nothing's changing on my end. Still the giveaway as always. Um, you know, feel free to use the Patreon system to contact me as always. But it did absolutely leave a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, why, why would anybody have thought that was a good idea to do in the first place um, is beyond me. And who knows what they're capable of next. So I'm still going to keep my eyes open. According to the survey, which you guys could still vote if you want, um, half, of the, half of the people who subscribe just want me to, to leave well enough alone and not move. So I will not go to another platform unless there is a very good reason for it. Don't worry. Um, uh, another quarter don't care at all. And another quarter uh, really want me to leave still and probably feel just as uneasy as I do about supporting not content creators, but the company Patreon. So I guess that's a really long way of saying everything's the same for now, but I do have my eyes on a couple of other services. I'd like to find one that accepts Bitcoins just because I find it very strange that none of them do. Uh, but anyway, um, so thank you so much for all the people that do support me on Patreon, for all the people that left but came back. Thank you too. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's sad that such a very cool and unique platform that really carved a niche out for themselves really just shot themselves in the foot so we'll see what happens in the future but short term nothing changes and thank all you guys very very much next i have some more info on the super sd system 2 that device that plugs into a turbo graphics or pc engine and it's a rom cart an optical drive emulator and a video output board uh, last week I talked a bit about the output connector and the dangers of using a Genesis 2 port and I spoke a little bit more with the Neo SD team and saw some posts online and I wanted to respond directly to that because I've gotten a lot of questions about this. So basically, if you use a Genesis 2 port, that means you have to design your video output signal to a properly built Genesis 2 cable, which has resistors and capacitors in it. And then you have to hope that your customers buy properly built cables and not just some cheap $2 ones from China. So that's kind of the concern. And, and that was my, um, my criticism to the design because I felt they should have used something that could have just had a pass through cable. But um, it seems like they've definitely modified the board a little bit so that it will work with these cables. And the bottom line is it'll work and it will not hurt your equipment. It's not like they're sending too much voltage or anything like that. Everything, as long as you buy a properly built cable, everything should work perfect in your setup. Um, you know, I wish they had used a pass through cable, but that's besides the point. Another thing that I wanted to mention though is they posted scope plots on the Schmups forum that shows the voltage that's being outputted. And I haven't gotten a chance to speak with them more about this, but if that's the circuit that they're actually using on the board, it's going to be a little bit too bright. So a, a good example would be a stock one chip versus a one chip with a brightness attenuating resistors. So it's not bad. But it's just my feeling that uh, for something so expensive, it really would have been nice to have the circuit as perfect as possible. 
Uh, Voltar sent me a picture that we had actually taken last year, I think, using um, when we were comparing the different designs. So you see an improperly built circuit. Uh, I think that's a 7314 chip. And then you see Tim's AV driver, which does a great job. And then you'll notice that Voltar's was a little bit darker, but that's not a bad thing. Uh, he actually measured that circuit using a scope um, and properly measured it and posted all of his scope plots as well to prove his work because good nerds always prove their work. Uh, and so it just kind of goes to show the difference. Now, of course, you could do things like turn down the brightness on your TV or with an o uh, OSSC or Frame Meister. I just, uh, I really hope that they make one last check before they start shipping these things to make sure that that circuit is as good as possible. Um, you know, you have to keep in mind that there's going to be the 75 ohm resistors on the RGB lines in the cable. And, but basically, if you just take that RGB output, feed it into the chip, and stick that chip out to the cable, it's going to be a little bit too bright. So I could talk in detail about this, um, you know, we, but the most important thing is this is just speculation. I haven't spoken to them directly about it yet. Um, I, I plan on it, uh, just mentioning it, but you know, I don't want to, I'm certainly not harping on their design. This is just me being overly critical like I always am. And like I hope that people are to me when I do technical work as well. So I guess the bottom line is um, it looks fine. Um, uh, they're, their circuit and the way they're doing it looks fine in that it's not going to hurt your equipment. If for whatever reason you buy one and you don't feel like it's as good as your existing solution, you could actually continue to use that. The only thing that you do not want to do is plug two outputs. So don't have an internal mod. Like uh, the one I always love to do is when you remove the RF jack and then you put one of those ports of an upside down soldered to the board so you don't have to cut the plastic. If you have one of those, like a lot of my friends do, and you prefer to use that current solution, just make sure to use that AV port and not have two outputs because if you do use two outputs you're going to draw double the current and you could actually uh, you could hurt a lot you could hurt um, the amps the console itself probably not your display but still it's some you know it's an expensive console so I tried to make that as short as possible um, I hope it came out okay this is like the fifth take because there was about a thousand sirens and crazy shit going on outside so I uh, you know I had to redo it for that too but uh, if anybody has any questions, um, just let me know down below and I could try to explain it more. This is still speculation and I think there's still time for them to tweak and change it. I'm just going on what they posted online. So uh, maybe I'm wrong, but then they posted the wrong screenshot. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I hope that was good enough and not too long of a description, but I'm still very excited to try the product. Um, I hope they take the time to do all the last minute little fine tuning and tweaking to make it as perfect as possible and hopefully I'll be able to get a review out soon enough. Next, Analog posted a video showing the Super NT's menu and features and this thing looks exactly as awesome as you would expect a Kevin Horton product to look. So I am absolutely thrilled for this thing. I cannot wait to try it out on my OLED TV. The first thing I'm going to do is grab one of those Super Metroid MSU um, things that I've been loving to play and just play through the entire game and just really put this thing through its paces. I have uh, probably overly high expectations based on the Analog NT Mini and how much I raved about it last year. So I hope it lives up to uh, the product that was released last year and is just as awesome. I think it will be, but we'll find out. I'll get a review out as soon as I possibly can. I got kind of a fun one for you. When I was at the office the other day, I wanted to do a few light gun comparison tests before some of the monitors left, and I stuck the D32 next to a Mitsubishi Megaview, and I was able to use the PlayStation 2 with um, a com the composite video output so that you could run both at the same time. So RGB was going into the D32 and composite was going into the Megaview, and it was really neat to see because as much as the D32 is absolutely freaking amazing, I actually, even though it was only composite video, for light gun games, I had more fun playing on the 37 inch Mega View. Cause I think um, it's about 24 inches square on a 32 inch wide monitor. So it'd be 24 inches versus 37. That's, you know, it's a pretty big difference. So Ben from iFix Retro was there with me and uh, he kept going back and forth cause he loved the clarity of the D32 and how sharp that thing is. 
but he said the the 37 made it feel like he was playing in an arcade so i don't know i thought it was pretty neat but um, i'm sticking to what i've been saying that for light gun and those 3d games especially the few good sega cd sega 3d games that are out there um the bigger the better so uh you know i'm always going to prefer to play through like Link to the Past and Super Metroid on the highest quality BVM I can, but when it comes to Duck Hunt, Safari Hunt, and especially like Missile Defense 3D, just give me the biggest freaking CRT you could find. It looks like a member of the Hyperkin team leaked a project they were working on, a portable Nintendo 64, and at first I, I kind of wondered, like, is this, um, is this a marketing scheme or did one of their devs really leak a project they were working on? And uh, I, I honestly don't know. And I didn't want to reach out to, uh, to Chris from Hypercane about that because I, just, I don't want to put him in a weird place if it is a, a marketing thing. But it looks like a dev just took pictures of the product that he really felt should be released and just stuck it on Facebook. So, uh, I mean, that's anybody that's ever worked in R&D, that's just about the dumbest thing you could do for a million reasons. You know, number one, they probably have a ton of products that they make just to see how feasible it would be to do in production, just to test market, uh, market strength of it and all that stuff. So to leak something that might have just been a one-off is awful. Um, I've made prototypes before that are the epitome of what I tell people not to do. I have made prototypes filled with glue, with the worst work done, with wads of wires, just because I needed something to show at a trade show for a day that, you know, the outside's representative of the final product, not the inside. And one time I did have somebody who I sent a prototype to for functional testing, pull it apart and put the pictures online saying, look at these guys, piece of crap computer. It was really upsetting. I was very blunt in telling them like, hey, this is for you to try. This is not, you know, this isn't a production thing. All these things are going to be different. So um, if this was a real leak, I imagine Hyperkin would be freaking livid for all of those reasons. But this also does remind me of a couple of the times that uh, it was revealed later on that Apple purposely leaked misinformation about their products to see what people would say. And I think if I'm remembering correctly, the big one was when the original iPhone came out, they leaked like a $900 price point for it or something. Um, and by doing that, they listened to the backlash and kind of got a, an idea of what people would be willing to pay. And that's kind of how they based their pricing. Now, I don't know if that story is true. That's what I heard through the grapevine, through some of my old business contacts and everything. But I don't know. If it's a, if it's a marketing thing, it's real cheesy. <laughs> uh, if it's not a marketing thing, that poor guy's probably getting fired because you should never, ever leak R&D stuff like that. It just it sucks for everybody. So I don't know. Interesting story, at least interesting to me. So I figured I would tell everybody about it. It looks like the Flashmaster team has a 15% off sale for the holidays. So if you were looking to get the Neo Flashmaster, now would be a good time to pick it up. And also their Wonder Swan ROM cart is, all, uh, is now available and in stock. So if you're waiting for one of those as well, um, go for it. I still haven't even actually seen a Wonder Swan in person. So maybe one day I'll borrow one and one of these flash cards and do a review. Next, it looks like someone's been reverse engineering Nintendo's WaveBird wireless controller for the GameCube. And while I don't think there's any direct applications for this right now, this is a very cool project that's, um, that's something that's probably going to be the base work for other very cool stuff. So I guess if uh, it was really done by somebody who wanted to learn more about the digital radio protocols and wanted to post not just the info on the WaveBird controller, but how he came to those conclusions and got the, the info, which is great for anybody that was looking to learn stuff like this or to take a project like this and implement it themselves. So uh, if you're looking for some super nerdy dev stuff, definitely check out the GitHub and see what new and awesome stuff that you could do with it. The G Comp switch and G Scart switch lights should be going on sale again soon. Super G said he was aiming for a January 2nd date in order to put these up for sale and that they're actually going to be in stock. This won't be a pre-order. And the last time he did that, everything shipped relatively quickly. So if you've been waiting on one of those, plan on January 2nd and I'll try to send out a tweet or something as soon as they go on sale. Someone on the SMS Power Forums has been designing their own MK2000 to Master System cartridge converter. 
So it fits inside of a regular Sega Master System cartridge and then allows you to plug in MK2000 cartridges right on top of it. I thought it was pretty cool, and I, I know of the opposite, but I, uh, you know, Master System on MK2000, but I've never used one of the opposites before, so this is kind of neat. Um, I don't think there's any plans for sale yet, which is kind of disappointing because the same developer, Was Up, has done a couple other things in the past that I really wanted to buy that never went up for sale. So I guess at the moment, if you're a dev and you just kind of want to check out somebody's work, that's a you know pretty cool thing to look at. But I don't think there's any plans for them to be on sale. Um, hopefully there will be, as well as his other products, but I'll keep everybody posted. During a recent interview, two of Nintendo's lead developers were talking about their love for the Switch's detachable controllers, both the fact that just by owning a Switch you have two controllers, and that you could use the motion controls by having one in each hand. So while they didn't go into specifics on what exactly they're going to come up with next, they did hint that both through Nintendo and other third-party developers, you could expect games that really utilize those and make them part of the gameplay. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to try one of those out in the future. Atari decided to postpone taking pre-orders for their new Atari Box console, and I kind of saw that one coming because I think that would have been a bit of a nightmare. Um, trying to take pre-orders for something with no exact release date and no list of games. So, uh, or, or really even a clear indication of what games are going to be on there. Uh, so it's probably the right thing to do. Um, I certainly wasn't going to back it without knowing what was going to be on the console. Uh, so I guess uh, I'll keep everybody updated if it goes back up for pre-order at some point. But it was supposed to start last week and uh, I guess there's no plans or no announcement on when the pre-orders will open. Kevtris recently posted on the forums to clear up some speculation on the NT Mini's cores, the FPGA cores that emulate other consoles. And uh, a few of the things that he said I thought were pretty obvious, but I'm just going to make sure to let everybody know. When the NT Mini was released last year, the reason it had so many cores available for it was because Kevtris had been working on those for years prior. So this was something that he'd been working on forever. He had them almost ready, and he really just needed to tailor them to the NT Mini's platform. Uh, and at the moment, there are no more cores that he's been working on, except the Intellivision. I think he just has to add or, or tweak one or two things on it before that's added to the NT Mini. But he's always said that. So I think a lot of people were speculating that you know he had done all of this miraculous work in the past year and was going to be releasing, you know, all these crazy cores. And that's, uh, according to him, that's just not true. And it makes sense because I, I think people seem to underestimate how much work it actually takes to get these uh, up and running and especially to the accuracy level that Kevin does. The other thing that he said uh, was a little disappointing to me, the, uh, you know, the greedy fanboy. And he said that he has not started working on a Genesis core at all. He doesn't know if he will. Um, and if he does, it's not going to include Sega CD or 32X support. So the not working on the Genesis thing yet, it, you know, not knowing if he's going to get to it, that's totally fine. I, I mean, I, it takes a lot of time. But the, the Sega CD thing, no one has a really good optical drive emulator at all for it now. And I don't know that anybody's really made the progress with that. Because I guess there's a bunch of other chips uh, around the Sega CD you'd have to emulate as well. And as much as the 32X is mostly a dud, um, actually anybody that's seen DF Retro's video on it will know that there's not too much worth going on that library. It is a piece of history, and having these really accurate FPGA cores floating around is just an amazing way to preserve that history. So, um, you know, uh, hopefully somebody will offer him a gazillion dollars to go in and, uh, and make a, a new project with all these things in them. But as of now, um, you know, no, no surprises coming out of nowhere. Uh, there's no, you know, new cores for the NT Mini. And if he does eventually work on the Genesis for whatever reason, it looks unlikely that the Sega CD or 32X would be part of it. I just mentioned DF Retro, and they actually have just released a new video about Rare Software. So the company that did Donkey Kong Country and Killer Instinct. 
And as always, John really went through and gave you side-by-side -side examples of all of the different versions of it, so you could really get a feel for the differences. But this one was more documentary style, and I absolutely loved it. Um, it just such a very cool story, and I was so fascinated about how they actually got these games to work the way they did. So if you're a fan of Donkey Kong Country or Killer Instinct or really just a nerd that likes to peer behind the curtain, definitely check this video out. Badass Consoles recently tweeted a picture of what seems to be final prototypes of the GC Video X. So in its current form, it seems that those plugs, which is the hardest thing to make and the most time consuming to get mass produced, it appears that those plugs are production samples. Um, so not prototypes, but actually a sample from a run of production. And it appears that the boards are in pretty much a final stage and that the outer case is still a 3D print. So I would guess, based on some of the conversations we'd had in the past and this picture, that he still needs to finalize the outer plastic design, and I know he'd been working on special custom firmware to add extra features to his version of it. So, um, you know, I'll keep everybody updated on when they're shipping, release dates, and all that other stuff. Uh, if he's still waiting on outer plastic designs with this, with the holiday, holidays here, and then if he's getting them from China with Chinese New Year, I mean, depending on how many he's ordering and when it's placed, it could be three months before they're done. So uh, I know that that would mean that he's, you know, a year and a half late plus, um, and I don't really know what to say about any of that. It's not my business, literally. So uh, if you guys are pissed, uh, take it elsewhere because this has nothing to do with me. I'm just letting every keeping everybody in the loop of what I know and the facts on when the release date is and how close it's coming. So. My guess, based on just looking at the picture, if the order is already in for the outer casings, probably a month, and if the order is not in, it could be three months. But that's just my guess. Wardy has just released a new version of his N64 RGB board, and uh, it looks like he added a few more features, as well as all the ones that he'd been working on for a while now. Uh, it was pretty exciting for N64 fans because it could add features like um, 480p line doubling and things like that. My favorite feature is what he also released for free for anybody that has Tim's board, and that's the deblur stuff. Uh, I personally love it, and I always have deblur turned on at all times. And you know, any any of the deblurring stuff and removing of the anti-aliasing looks, in my opinion, better on monitors. Because uh, I obviously prefer to play this stuff on RGB monitors or through the Ultra HDMI, which has all of its amazing features built in. So I hope to get Bordy on soon to talk with him about these things. Um, I've been a fan of his and doing work with him for years now, so I really hope I get to have him on to, to really chat about this stuff and really pick his brain from all the things that we've been working on. So uh, if you're interested, check it out. And I believe the guys from iFix Retro are ordering some of these to do some installs. And when they do, I will do like a, at least a mini review of it if I don't have time for a full review and really just show the installation and uh, the different features that it has. And lastly, the Retro Roundtable is having their podcast tomorrow, the 21st, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, assuming I didn't screw up the date and time again. But if you guys could make it live, that's always a little bit more fun because you could kind of jump in and be part of it. But if not, we always offer it as an audio podcast, or you could just check it out on YouTube after the fact. So uh, the more the merrier. Uh, we all enjoy doing it very much, and hopefully we'll have a fun one. So maybe I'll just sit there and get drunk on eggnog or something. But uh, yeah, hope to see you guys there, and hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Now on to the Q&As. First up, Kaiser posted in response to my rant about how much I liked Ori in the Blind Forest and recommended the game Hollow Knight, which looks like it's actually going to be released on the Switch in early 2018, probably in January. So um, I'll add that one to my list. Thank you for sharing. It looks very similar and uh, Metroidvania-esque. So uh, thanks for the suggestion. Next, there are a whole bunch of questions regarding VHS to digital transfer. And that's something I really want to cover. Um, I've been doing it for years. I wrote a whole guide on it you know, a million years before Retro RGB. Uh, but it's really time consuming to get it right. And I think things have changed quite a bit on the software end of things. But I will do just a very quick rundown on the hardware side. So you want a good VCR, 
Fuda actually recommended a Sony VCR that has a Ferruja upscaler built in. That's composite video only, but apparently very high quality. So one of those, I think they usually run for around $50, which is pretty cool. Um, you could also do one of the JVC 9800s, which are very expensive, but you could use S-Video out from those. Um, if you stumble across an SVHS player, depending on the player and the way it's built, you may or may not get a big improvement in quality over composite video, but it's really hit or miss. I certainly wouldn't go spending a lot of money on something unless you knew it was one of the higher end ones. Uh, and as far as capture equipment, you either want a time-based corrector, which writes it from analog to digital back to analog, and then actually removes any macrovision or cleans the signal so none would be detected, or you need a capture card that doesn't look for macrovision at all. Uh, and once again, um, the macrovision was an analog copy protection scheme, which very often capture cards would interpret tape noise as macrovision. So if you have a shaky concert bootleg or just an old tape with some interference, your digital copy might look really bad um, just because the, the capture card thinks it's macrovision and does whatever the, you know, the protection required. So I think I actually still have one of those USB capture cards up for sale for anybody that needed that. Um, but that's composite video and S video. And as long as you set the settings right, uh, you get a pretty good transfer. Um, now on the software side of things, somebody had actually posted a video that looked really cool um, and the post-processing part is really where things have uh, evolved quite a bit. And to be honest, I would love you guys' feedback on that as well, because while the video he linked to went into detail about VHS, I'm wondering what else could be done with certain DVD conversions. So, I mean, on average, if you have a really good upscaling Blu-ray player, your DVDs will look great, but nothing will look quite as good as having a multi-pass upscale. Uh, and I wonder if you could do other cool things, like can you uh, have some kind of filter put in, so you take what is essentially like a 480i or 480p DVD, and then upscale it and then put it through so it looks like it's going through a CRT. Kind of like scan lines, but you could draw them on each frame, I guess, because you don't have to do it in real time. I wonder if anybody's ever done that, and how would it look? I'm going to have a podcast with Cousin Scott soon, because we actually did a whole bunch of these testing recently, just for our own curiosity. And then after we were finished with it all, we realized that we learned a bunch of really valuable information that could be fun for people to, who want to know the hardware side of things. Because I'll tell you right now, a lot of the, the 480p or 480i content I've seen looks great on a flat screen through a very good upscaler, but looks way better on a really nice CRT. So uh, we'll get into all of that hopefully soon. Hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do that podcast before the holidays. But so that's pretty much it for the hardware end of the VHS conversion. You know, get get the right VHS player, um, get a capture card that doesn't uh, that doesn't look for macrovision, or use a time-based corrector to remove that. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get some software solutions up soon and do some really high quality deinterlacing and upscaling to, I mean, I can't imagine uh, you would need to upscale a VHS tape to 4K. But that being said, if you have a 4K player, wouldn't you want to try to give it its native resolution? So I'd love to do all of those testing on the software side as well and really see the difference. So. Uh, I guess stay tuned for the podcast with Scott. And if you have any comments on the software side of things, actually any comments on this VHS stuff at all, definitely post down below. I'd love to hear from you. Next, YouTube user asked, at what point should I start considering a distribution amplifier? I have a cross point outputting to a couple of PVMs and a computer TV monitor, but not usually more than two screens at a time. Should I be concerned about voltage amplification outputs and picture degradation to say three or four screens? So what I would do personally in your situation is just get a cross point with more outputs. So um, you know you can get very, very cheap one of those eight by eights or I think even 12 by 12s, which means 12 in and 12 out. And you could arrange those since they're matrix switches in any order. So port one could be outputting to port two while port three is outputting to port nine or something like that. So those are really great devices. And in the limited testing I have, I did not see any sig signal degradation at all. 
the My Life in Gaming guys really didn't either when they did their Switch video. So I, I'm a fan of those. Um, but you do have to realize that the ones that, I, that people have been testing do output TTL level sync. So if you're going to, uh, well, check the spec sheets of all of the devices you're going to, but all of the PVMs that I personally have looked up can handle TTL no problem. Same with the BVMs. You know, and I've tested, I've looked up quite a few, but not all, so please check for your own. Um, same thing with computer monitors. But anything that has a SCART input is generally gonna need the lower voltage, so you would want probably a 470 ohm resistor in that SCART head, and that would be for anything like the open source scan converter, the frame meister, an RGB modded television, pretty much anything that's expecting a SCART signal, um, is, you're gonna want that resistor on the sync line. But that kind of comes in handy because all of those devices would have a SCART plug in the end, so you could just add that resistor to your uh, SCART to BNC, I guess technically BNC to SCART cables. So, um, I guess that was a long way of saying I really wouldn't use a distribution amplifier. I would just get a cross point with more outputs and skip that extra step because every everything you put in the chain in an analog video signal is going to reduce the quality. Some might be so low that you'd have to zoom in a hundred times to notice. Others is a lot worse. So I would just always reduce the amount of components possible between, use short cables whenever possible. Um, and then for the second part of your question, anything with a SCART input, um, you know, it's always best if you test with a scope, but putting a 470 ohm resistor on the sync line is probably a safe thing to do. My last Q&A is a question for you guys. I just finally ordered the box set of my favorite movie of all time. Uh, my favorite movie is actually Taxi 2. Uh, but I got the whole box set because one is awesome as well. The problem is this box set only came with the French and German subtitles and audio tracks. Now I would originally, I would want the original French audio track on there. I hate vocal dubbing. And to be perfectly honest at this point, I probably don't even need the subtitles just because I've seen the movies so many times. I probably could just recite every word that they say. But I do like to watch these with friends and have a couple beers and laugh. They're basically like, a, it's made by Luc Besson, the guy that did The Transporter. So they're fun action comedies with good music in them. But I need English subtitles for them, and all of the ones I've downloaded don't line up. So while I could go back and rewrite the subtitles manually myself, um, uh, it would be really great if I could just find a way to not. Because <laughs> that would take, you know, if the movie is an hour and 40 minutes long, it would probably take three hours per movie uh, minimum. So uh, does anybody know of good places to get subtitles that I could maybe just match with the amount of minutes of the MKV that I've ripped this to? Because I do have a player where you could actually put play the disc and put subtitles on a USB stick, but I've already ripped them to ISO and then MKV just to make it easier. So does anybody know of a place where I could just take the length of that MKV and then find a subtitle to match the movie of that length so that I could just remux it and then have a file that's perfect Blu-ray quality with all of the English subtitles in it? Um, if you know the answer to that, please post down below because I've been wanting to have a few friends over that have never seen these movies before and watch at least the first two, uh, you know, have a couple of beers and just get silly. So if you guys know anything about that, um, I know a bunch of my French speaking friends already know these movies, but you know, if you already speak French, why would you ever have to worry about subtitles? So if, if anybody could help, please let me know. Um, and uh, thank you in advance if you have any solutions. Last week I aired an interview with Evan from SNES Central, and his website has really just been an invaluable tool for anybody who's a fan of the SNES or really just anything related to any of the game PCBs, rare prototypes. Um, you know, that site has archived tons of information, um, PCB scans, and pretty much it, at some point in your life, if you were a fan of the SNES, you would probably stumbled across his website. So it was really great to uh, to speak to him and to hear about the work that he's done. Uh, and it just, you know, overall a very laid back and interesting interview that I would recommend to anybody who's a fan of either SNES Central or just the Super Nintendo in general. So please check it out if you're interested and follow him on Twitter uh, if you'd like updates. Well, that's pretty much it for this week. 
Uh, I still have a bunch of RGB monitors and some really cool consumer grade CRTs up for sale. So please check the list and uh, if there's anything you're interested in, let me know right away because things are going pretty quickly. I unfortunately have had a few times where people were talking about buying it and then somebody just showed up and bought it that day. So, you know, thank you to everybody, by the way, though. Everybody has been very cool and very easy to deal with. Uh, it's not so much in the music side of things. Selling higher end music equipment draws a different crowd, but I've been very lucky on the retro gaming side of things. So thanks to everybody who bought anything. Um, if anybody's interested, please jump on it now because it's all going pretty quickly. And uh, if anybody knows of a place where I could sell some of the music stuff, I think I'm only down to like three items anyway. Uh, one of them an amp. I thought that was going to sell right away because it's a brand new amp for like half price. Uh, the double neck guitar, I realize that's going to sit on eBay for uh, probably another year until the person who's always wanted that guitar, you know, logs in and finds it. So that's understandable. But if you happen to know anybody, please pass them the links to all this stuff. Um, you know, I'll be happy to to give, give it to a, a good home, somebody that knows what they're getting. And the arcade machine, too, is for sale. Um, you know, it's up for whoever wants to buy it. If I don't sell it by the end of the year, I guess the end of the month now, I might have another idea, but uh, I do need to get rid of these things rather quickly. So for anybody that wants the last few things that are left, try to come and get them pretty quickly because they're going to go right away. And if the arcade machine doesn't sell, uh, I'm going to try to do something fun with it. So uh, hopefully it'll go to a good home now right away. But if not, uh, you know, I guess you guys will be seeing a video about that soon if not. So uh, thank you as always to all my Patreons, especially for sticking with me after all the drama and crap that just happened. Thank you once again to everybody who bought something and, and, and made it very, made it painless on me, both literally and figuratively. And, uh, you know, looking forward to the stuff coming up in the new year. And I will see you guys soon.